Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of The Moving Screen. I'm Brendan Quinn with The Athletic. I'm here with Dylan Burkhart of UM Hoops. We have a lot to discuss this week. Um, Dylan, as we said, last week was Michigan heavy. I think this week will probably be a little bit more Michigan State and Big Ten heavy. Um, sound about right to you, man? Sounds right. We got a slow week for Michigan, but a big week for the whole conference coming up with the uh... – ACC Big Ten Challenge. Uh, you got a lot to chew on watching Michigan State over the weekend in Las Vegas, too. I'm only here, uh, full disclosure, I'm only here for the uh, the net hot takes from from Dylan. The net is bullshit. We're not we're not <laughs> even going down that road. Are you how are you feeling about Ohio State as the number one team in the country? I have no problems with any of the rankings. I have mm-hmm. a problem with the fact that the entire thing is a farce. Hmm. There's no there's no transparency. We don't know anything about how it's made. They just rank the teams. They don't even tell us how far apart they are. Every other ranking, you have some sort of rating number, right? Mm-hmm. You can tell that the number one team is this far from the number two team. The net is just one, two, three, four. Here's your rankings. Take them or leave them. And get big and ride and die with Loyola Marymount. That's all I know. Well, I, I, w- one day we will dedicate an entire episode to um, Dylan talking about numbers and net while I uh, probably pour a short glass of something brown and, and laugh my ass off. I'm really looking forward to that day. Can you promise that we can- – that's all I want for Christmas, Dylan. Can we do that? We'll, we'll, give, we'll give you what you want. We'll Thank just talk you. about the net for 30 minutes. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be spectacular. But today we will start with uh, – Michigan State and a trip to Las Vegas. Dylan, you'd be very proud. I came out. Uh, How did fourteen do? A little richer than than normal. Yeah, we did. We did pretty good. We did pretty good. Let's just say good. the uh, the Christmas tree that I cut down on Saturday but paid for itself or yesterday. There you it was go. On Sunday. Yeah, free Christmas tree. That's that's pretty good. And it's I feel a big like a, week. And I feel like a good way to spend your gambling winnings. You know, there's the holiday spirit. You can say you know if, if you have any qualms about gambling being immoral. Well, you know, maybe you spend it on, uh, you know, the Christmas holiday Christmas. and cheer and all that good stuff. So that's where Nothing I'm at. says Christmas like winning money in Vegas. <laughs> so, well, Thanksgiving literally had a, I had Thanksgiving dinner at an Italian restaurant in Las Vegas, uh, with four other sports writers, which, um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if that's how the holiday was intended. It sounds like a bad, like Johnny Cash song or something like that, but, um, that was my Thanksgiving holiday. How was your holiday? That's how it was man? intended for you. <laughs> Watching hoops. Do you have a good Thanksgiving, though, brother? It was good. It was good. Uh, so Ann Arbor got to see the uh, Chattanooga Mox take mm. on the Wolverines and uh, ready to get back into some little higher quality hoops. Well, I got to see some good hoops. Uh, that was the good thing about my trip to Vegas. Um, really came away with. I was an emotional roller uh, roller coaster for uh, Michigan State. You know, they came out. They looked great against UCLA, but it's this t- weird time of year where I'm watching UCLA and I'm saying this is the, one of the most garbage performances I've ever seen by a top 25 team. Um, they went from looking disinterested early on to demoralized later and really just never put up any kind of test in what I thought was going to be a pretty decent game. Uh, and then the next game... Michigan State looks in over its head, just a total nightmare of a beginning. Ten turnovers in the first eight minutes. Um, you know, it's look. it was looking at that time like, oh, man, you know, they're going to come out of this weekend with more questions than answers. They're going to have two losses on the schedule um, and really kind of going to have to be trying to find himself. You know, all these cliche things that you say about teams early on. And then lo and behold uh, – you know, they light Texas up, they start playing balls out, and, and went and got a really, really impressive win, ended up running them out of the gym. And so now you're leaving, and it's a completely different storyline, um, all in the matter of two hours. I guess that's what's pretty awesome about basketball, though. Yeah, where did you see that game turn? It seemed like there's kind of a moment there late in the first half where it looked like it was headed that direction. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm still unsure if there was any direct cause to you know eliminating the turnovers they still had 12 or something like that over the course of the game which is too many over 32 minutes but 
Um, I mean, you can't do anything when you commit turn turnovers in eight minutes. I don't, I don't care who you are. You're just eliminating half of your possessions. It's going to be impossible. And Texas was shooting the shit out of it like they did against UNC when they looked great. So um, I think Texas was probably a little bit um, out of its mind early on and riding the momentum of that UNC game and then kind of came back to life a little bit or back to reality a little bit, whereas State, um, you know, Joshua Langford and Cassius Winston, I think, kind of took control of that game and, and they started making shots. And um, for as bad as they were early, they shot the ball that well late, um, especially Langford and Winston. And they were, I mean, they were just landing haymakers there in the second half with some of those transition pulls. Um, that was, you know, that's what you think of Michigan State if you think they're going to be good this year. That's what they look like. They were 8 of 11 from 3 in that second half. Um, hard, hard to lose when you go eight of 11 from three and a half. I hope um, my coffee mug didn't just resonate in the microphone. We've had a couple complaints right. about our sound quality, including my brother saying last week we sounded like we were in a tin can, but, uh, a lot of, I got a lot of that feedback last week. Uh, Kevin can go to hell. Uh, your listeners or your, your people I'm sure have valid arguments, but Kevin can go to hell. Happy Thanksgiving. brother. <laughs> <laughs> so give me your thoughts. So you had the TV view, which is oftentimes actually a little bit better um, than, than being there in real time and, and kind of breaking it down as you see it in front of you. Um, what, what were your takeaways from my, my two biggest two thoughts games? on Michigan State in those games, but really the whole year is one, it is, well, it's two things that they do more of than any Michigan State team under Izzo. They run the ball and they play in transition. They play at a faster pace than any of Izzo's previous yeah. teams. And then they shoot more threes than any of Izzo's previous teams. Um, And they're pretty damn good at shooting threes, at least Langford and Winston. You can't really give those guys enough three-point shots because they're shooting 45%, 47% from three. You got to keep shooting until you're shooting 38% at that rate. Um, And they turn the ball over, but if you're getting a three-point shot on every other possession, it's not going to be the end of the world. And, they're just running so fast that they just kind of seem to be wearing these teams out. Um, have you, do you think – what do you think it is behind the kind of that crazy tempo that they're playing this year? And do you think that three-point shooting and the volume behind it is why they're sort of up and down or they have sort of a slow start to that Texas game? Well, I mean, I, I, I still think everything comes back to the turnovers um, and that sometimes they can be a little bit um, outsized down low. Um, what do I think is at the root of, of – getting those free buckets is I think a lot of it's just the makeup of this team and that you got, you have guys who can go and create with the ball and pass, shoot and make decisions. Um, you know, I, I, I really like the ball in Langford and Winston's hands right now because they, they do more often than not make the right decisions on, on where to go with it. Um, but the problem of these turnovers, I don't know how related it is. I, I mean, You'd have to go back and look at like every clip and stuff like that, which obviously you're capable of doing. But um, like how much of it, because so many of their turnovers are unforced, which is really the, it's a concern and it's also a, a, a plus because those are things that are solvable. But until they're solved, it's an issue. But, you know, when you're constantly rushing and things are going 100 miles an hour, that's when you're going to see these unforced turnovers. You know, four of them, I think, were Kenny's in the first half, Kenny Goins. Um, and that's just, you know, putting the ball in a guy's hands um, who's really not apt for, for that spot. You know, some of their some of their guys are much much more reliable in a half-court set than, than getting up and down. You know, they don't have these flying four-man wings, right, who can kind of fill in and catch it and make a decision 15 feet from the basket or something like that. There was... There was one play, I think, when Cassius threw a transition pass um, to Kenny Goins, like 40 feet from the basket, and he had – There was he, it was an automatic turnover. I don't even remember what he did with it, but it was an automatic turnover. There was one, I think he tried to throw an alley-oop. Um, there was that, too. That yeah. just got completely stolen oh, got, like, by uh, it, the big kid on Texas. Yeah, so there's still a they lot turned, of that stuff. They turned the ball over 24 times. In a 72 possession game, that's 33 percent of their possession. So one th- it's up the floor every time they're every three times they're turning the ball over. That's and they've still played a, the second best game anyone's played offensively against Texas. That's a pretty uh, crazy stat because if you 
shoot the ball like they shoot it and have a, and rebound the ball like they have they rebounded half their misses and shot 60% from 3. If you can fix the turnovers, that's a runaway train on offense. You right. can't really stop that. Well, and a, and a lot of it's also um you know he's playing this large rotation where these there are still a lot of guys funneling in and out of there and you know this weekend was a really interesting example of what do you have trying to figure out what do you have because when you see Aaron Henry do it one game and then barely play or he barely played the first game and then was a real difference maker in turning that game around on uh, on Friday you know that makes you scratch your head Thomas Kithier kind of the same thing one game he's a, he's a factor the next game he's not Marcus Bingham the same thing one game a factor one game he's not um you know, is it just going to be this all year, 11 guys, and just go with what works? Um, based on recent history, probably. Is that fair to say, Dylan? I think I think that's fair. I think Aaron Henry's a guy who really, when you see him play, he stands out for, mm-hmm. he can really, I think their biggest weakness is sort of hanging in a, against a super athletic team, right. and they can kind of get punked a little bit early or jumped on and have to adjust, and he's really a guy who can hang in any sort of battle against athletes and sort of even the sale, so to speak, right? Like, yeah. calm everyone down. He say everyone can hang. He can get in the get in the lane a little bit. He played really well against Texas, and mm-hmm. I think that that's going to be a trend going forward. Yeah, I think he's going to have to – they're going to have to kind of lock him down into a, a, a steady rotation place. I'd almost like to see him kind of be the guy that checks in at a certain minute mark every single game. So he kind of gets into that mindset of really understanding – his spot and kind of what to expect. I feel like everyone's still fearing the quick trigger a little bit. Um, But in reality, it it all, it all really comes back to, to Winston and, and Langford. And I think both of them more and more are finding an understanding of when to shoot, when to go, when to kick, you know, these, you do have to remember they spent, the first two years of their college careers playing in a very different setup and in a different pecking order of things. Now it's, it's both of them um, having to make all these decisions, having to make the big shots and Friday, especially that second half against Texas, I, I think was a major step forward in those two taking ownership of, of the team of the program. And, uh, and that's a big step because, I think they're the it, when they are in the half court and things like that, you know, there is. I think Michigan State's getting better at moving the ball in the half court, and I think they're getting more quality kickouts than they've had um, certainly this year and, and probably even in, in recent years. But the the ball's moving more, and you know, part of that has to do with you're not playing through Miles Bridges, which kind of created different issues. But um, they're really unselfish, um, and they do look for the best shot when they are running offense and they don't turn it over. So uh, as long as those two are the catalyst and the ball's moving that way, you're going to find looks. We've seen it from Winston. Let's, I think we should talk more about Langford just because this is sort of uncharted territory for him mm-hmm. in terms of consistent production. I know you wrote about him. How do you kind of see him growing into this role and what has really changed for him, I guess? Um, he, well, one, he's in a really good headspace and two when when I talked to a guy like Mike Garland who really got into Josh Langford coming into a more understanding of what it means to play hard what it means to work hard what it means to understand the game what it means to not everything's just going to come easy because he has the most skills and stuff like that that it he, he told me this weekend it really took him a long time to understand what it's going to mean for him to be or what it's going to look like for him to be a great player. And, and one of the examples we talked about was something Langford always used to do was he could beat a guy off the bounce on maybe his first move, but then he would almost counter back into a different move and let the defender back into the play. And then he would get stuck and it would end up as a turnover or a bad two point attempt, you know, typically a long two, which is, I mean, you and I have talked about, a long time with with him like oh I, i've got some, i've got numbers ready got to go numbers? those those but those were the things you saw you know like he, he would do that he, he would get past the guy and then counter back and you're like well, just go make your move man like go to the basket or, or or take your shot and he would always try to do too much his whole game was just over complicated 
and I think you've seen it a lot more stripped down maybe this year. And he's he's a much quicker trigger when he when he does catch the ball for an open three, where he would kind of hesitate or maybe think about doing something. I think he's more likely to fire. Um, he's more likely to take guys off the bounce and actually try to finish at the rim and not just default to in between stuff. He's just much more aggressive, and um, he understands his game at this point. And I think it took a while to get there. And I think a prime example of him understanding some of his limitations was the fact that, and I, I wrote this this summer and some people laughed at me, but when, when Garland and I talked about it, it, it did kind of come back around. Um, you know, Him not going into the draft this summer, him not testing the waters. Um, people will, out there will say, well, of course Josh Langford didn't test the waters. Well, guess what? A lot of players who don't really need to test the waters, test the waters because they think in the back of their minds, well, if I were in a different system or if I got to do what I do, then I would certainly be as good as all these other guys. And all I, I just have to try out for NBA teams and they're going to see how good I am and I'm going to be a draft pick, right? This happens to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 players every single year. Langford wasn't one of those guys. Like he knew that was a waste of time for him and that he needed to put in work and that if he went and tried out, he would do stuff that would end up on a scouting report that would never come off of it. Like, he needed another year. So I think having an understanding like that is crucially important. And if you continue to see him play this year, I think that is at the root of it. Yeah, I think it's pretty simple. He is a 42% career three-point shooter. That's pretty crazy. He's attempted 238 threes. Last year... You think of him as a shooter, he only attempted 31% of his shots from three-point range. That number is way too low. He was attempting 34% of his shots in the mid-range. So he's taking more mid-range twos than threes. Mm -hmm. This year, those numbers have flipped. He's taken 50% of his shots from three-point range, which is what you would see from most players who are considered shooters. If you have someone who makes 42% of their threes, they need to take half their shots from three in the modern basketball. Hmm. Um, he's only attempting 21% of his shots from the mid range. That's a 13% drop, pretty significant. Yeah. Um, he's getting, he's getting to the rim a little less, but what I see when I watch him is just, he has the confidence to catch and fire on a spot up three without doing something else. He's realizing that the best option for him is to just catch and shoot and shoot over someone because that's going to be successful. Um, Synergy logs what they call spot-up possessions, which are essentially catch-and-shoot or Mm -hmm. catch-and-drive. A year ago, he was dribbling into a jump shot on 29% of his um, Mm spot-up possessions, which would mean basically a tough two. This year, that number is only at 8%. And all that difference is just going into no-dribble spot-up jumpers. So basically... He's taking the most efficient shot that he had, and he's just taking it more often. And I don't know if that is just a product of the system being designed more around him, so he comes to those shots more naturally, or his confidence, like you say. But it was crazy that he was such an inefficient player for two years, despite shooting 40% from three. Right. It's really hard to be a 40% three-point shooter, not turn the ball over, and be a mild, a somewhat inefficient offensive player now he looks the part and he's it's because he's shooting threes it's pretty simple yeah and all of his all of his numbers are, are up um his, his scoring is up and like i think this is if this team's going to be really good this is the range they need him in right he i think he's at about 17 or something like that a game like you you got to get that out of him pretty much every night um what do you think are the chances of him keeping this up that like this the guy that we're talking about right now is actually the mainstay for the year he's not going to shoot 48 percent from three all year but he's i I don't see with his track record you know he's going to shoot 40 percent from three i think it's and he has control over the shots he takes i don't really see that changing much Mm -hmm. maybe his his two-point shooting drops a bit his two-point shooting's up this year but it was also down last year i mean this is a player he should have been probably for the last two years and he's had moments he still has moments where he sort of drifts out of the game i think the texas game the first 11 minutes he didn't score um the kansas game the first half he really didn't score it was bad he didn't really he didn't contribute yeah and then he was great in the second half so he needs to i think consistency is still the thing um 
But any shooter is going to have some sort of consistency issues, but he just needs to keep shooting. It's mm-hmm. pretty simple. Um, and a couple missed mid-range jumpers aren't going to be all that bad if you've already hit four threes in a game. Yep. No one's going to be harping on you for that. Yep. So, so I don't really see – one, I don't see anyone that's going to take those shots away from him on that team. And two, I don't see – it's not like his 40 – he's not – his shooting's not really a fluke. He's been shooting that well from three point range his whole career. Right. Yeah. If anything, his two point shooting a year ago was maybe a fluke because some of his shots were just so bad where he was so desperate almost to get looks in that, in that offense. Yeah. Last year he shot 38% on twos in big 10 games, which is really bad. Yeah. Five, uh, 50, but as a 130, I mean, that's as a yeah, freshman well. though, he shot 56% on twos and he still took, all, so he can, I think as his confidence grows, he'll hit those mid-range jumpers more effectively too. It's just having the confidence to just catch and shoot from the Mm -hmm. perimeter instead of doing it too much, as you said, which just really kind of makes his game have a lot more flow, I feel like, and it really helps their offense. Well, I love that coming out of this um, trip to Vegas and the two wins, UCLA and Texas, um, that now they get a a winnable road game, but a road game – Nonetheless, um, going down to Louisville, I mean, look, it's not the normal um, Cardinals that you might expect, but it's still a good game. It's a road game, and it's a it's a really good example of, okay, Michigan State, we're going to talk about them having experience and experience in that. Now they, they it, everything is the, the opposite of what it's been the last two years when they always seem to be the young team playing older squads and blah, blah, blah. Now they have the experience. Everything's flipped. Well, if that's going to be the case, if that's going to be the storyline on this team, then you go and win at Louisville, right? I th- I think so. I think I see a lot of similarities between Michigan and Michigan State in these early season games where they both have a couple of dudes who have been through the wars, so to speak, mm-hmm. and they know what to expect. And you run into a team with guys who haven't, and it's quite apparent in November. Um, the same thing happened like UCLA that happened against maybe uh, Villanova early on, right? Um it just really speaks to that experience, and I. This is not a vintage Louisville team by any stretch of the imagination. So, but it is a tough place to play. So that'll be a really interesting sort of barometer for where they're at right now. Yeah, and Louisville just took uh, Marquette to overtime. Um, Marquette is not, you know, the greatest team in the world, but they they played them at Barclays Center, I believe, and took them to overtime. That's that's pretty decent. Um, the, they they scored 81 points against Tennessee. Uh, now they gave up 92, but um, you know Tennessee is obviously very very good. And you know that so the point being they're tested, right? They're coming. They they just had two games that they probably thought were winnable against Tennessee and Marquette, and are now get Michigan State, a top 10 team on their home floor, like at Louis, home. Louisville is going to be ready for this thing. Um, this is probably the biggest. This or not probably this is. Um, probably the biggest chance in Chris Mack's early tenure there, right? To, to deliver something, you know, you get, get the court rushed, get weird, get wild, you know, big party down there. Um, I, I'm definitely looking forward. I've never been to Yum Center, but um, I'm really kind of curious to see what the environment is going to be like down there. But I, I can't imagine it's going to be anything other than high quality, you know, college basketball, rocking and rolling, um, big time, big time venue, big time night. Bad news for Louisville, 283rd in three-point defense. Ooh. Not not necessarily going to be a great look uh, coming up. How are they on points off turnovers? They are ranked 261st forcing turnovers. Also not great, not but great. we'll see. I do think just going to on a, in a row game at a place where they're going to be ready for Michigan State to come, it'll be a good test and a really a chance to build on that momentum for Michigan State for sure for sure I'm looking forward to this one I would probably be inclined um I think Michigan State's feeling really really good about itself coming out of that trip um I would look for them to go down there and play I think they're going to keep this up I think they're going to play really really well um at at Louisville uh I think it might be an impressive performance coming up from them you got any kind of pick or any kind of feelings on this thing either way I would take the over. I think it's going to be a shootout. I think <laughs> both teams are going to 
I think both teams are going to uh, foul quite a bit, and it's going to be a bit of a sloppy game with a bunch of free throws, something we've seen a lot in a couple of these early Michigan State games. Um, Louisville's ranked second in the country and getting to the free throw line. Um, they're just going to try to muck it up, but I think it'll be an up and down game and Michigan state pulls away in the second half. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of, uh, Michigan state's feelings about itself kind of stem back or go back to that Kansas game. The fact that they played like crap, um, all those turnovers, all the mistakes, bad defense, a terrible start, uh, and they lost by five. And I think that's kind of stuck in the back of their heads that, you know, as long as they, in, in a lot of regards, don't kill themselves, they can beat a lot of teams. Um, but, you know, it was really interesting. Like last thought on Michigan State and just trying to figure out what is a, a difficult team to figure out. Um, the last play of the game against UCLA, Foster lawyers dribbling out the clock and... Tom is always yelling at him to play it out, right? Don't don't take a shot clock violation. Um, and the point was, like, we're, we're done with turnovers, right? I don't care if it means putting up a shot late in the game. We're done committing turnovers. So Lawyer throws up a prayer at the end of the shot clock, and it goes in and blah, blah, blah. And it was a joke afterward. And as I was saying, you know, yeah, I'm done. I'm done taking turnovers, and uh, that's the storyline. Well, the, ne- the next day, they commit 10 turnovers in the opening eight minutes of a game. And I'm just sitting there like... I mean, first of all, I can't imagine how mind-numbing it is to Izzo, but, like, just to watch it, um, you're just scratching your head. And and so, for as much as I can sit here and say, I think they're going to really play well against Louisville, um, I sure as hell did not expect them to go and commit 10 turnovers in eight minutes um, a day after that game against UCLA. So, we'll see. Uh, I've been proven wrong before. Um, I was not at Michigan Chattanooga, obviously. Dylan, you were, uh, I assume, watching from... The seats perched atop Chrysler. I, I was uh, not the most uh, exciting uh, Thanksgiving uh, hangover cure, but what was the crowd? It was, like? a, it was a good. I mean, no students, but it was pretty full for a Friday afternoon game in November. Um, solid crowd. Uh, game was never really all that competitive. Right. Uh, Michigan jumped out to a big lead early. Um, Chattanooga sort of died like we've seen every other team die against Michigan's defense uh the one notable thing on the defensive end is that they did get up a few extra three-point attempts and actually made nine in the game Beeline was pretty uh upset about that afterward uh was not happy that they attempted over 20 which Mm. is the first time that's happened against Michigan this year um the two big I guess thoughts on individual level from that game would probably be Isaiah Livers is still super hot. He's been on fire from three-point range. Hit a couple more threes in that game. Um, he's really growing with confidence sort of all over on the offensive side of the floor. There's one point he hit back-to-back elbow jumpers coming off a curl, which is something you haven't really seen from him at all. Um, so he's growing into that role. And then it's just even when Iggy Brasdakis doesn't seem to do anything spectacular, he ends up with 20 points and is leading the score sheet. He's been Michigan's... Uh, Ken Palm MVP in four of six games this year, mm-hmm. um, which is pretty impressive for a freshman who it really doesn't even seem like things filter through necessarily. Um, sort of just stumbles into his production, right? The ball finds him, and he does the one thing he knows how to do, which is put it in the basket. Um, so not really much to take out of that game, but sort of just par for the course for Michigan. Uh, so a couple things. I think the fact that the, the, to speak on your – point about Brasdakis and his ability to just get offense within the half court without anything being dialed up for him is just a huge positive for them right now because it'd be really hard to be to run a system that's dialing stuff up for Charles and Jordan Poole and you know on all these all these things all these things that you want to get out of it and just having one guy out there who just goes and gets his and doesn't need sets or circumstances is huge and that fearlessness that he has, um, it seems like he's not a guy who, if they go three or four possessions, you know, empty possessions, is going to start pressing or anything like that. You know, he's just, he's kind of, he's immune to that. Like, he's just, uh, he's kind of cold-blooded in that regard. And that's a huge plus. Um, Definitely. The one, the one thing I'd say about his sort of mindset is I think 
His three-point shot does sort of come and go with his confidence. He hit a couple threes. He was two of four from three against Chattanooga, and that sort of seemed to build him up. But when he misses that first three, he kind of hesitates whenever he the ball comes to him on the wing, and he probably could shoot. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the one thing to watch, I think, with his confidence level. He's, he'll have no fear of putting his head down and driving to the basket, but he's going to need to hit those threes too. Yeah, I think as, as, as scouting reports build on him, he's one of those guys, uh, you know, a good – a good coach who really does a, a hell of a scouting job on Michigan will, if he misses the first one, I sag, you know, I, I just, just, just beg him to keep shooting until he, until he makes it. I think that's a great point you bring up because once, once he starts getting to the basket and scoring, you know, and he's puffing his chest out and he's looking at the crowd and doing all this stuff, that's when he's going to catch shoot and bury stuff, you know, cause it's just, his confidence is just sky high. But, um, I make him prove that he's going to hit him any given day. So I'm 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 sitting back on him, and if he wants to drive, um, make it as difficult as possible on him. Um, another point, Kevin Easley. That's a blast from the past. How do you look? some late late game buckets? He had 21 in the game. He had a bunch of threes. He was really the reason that they got mm. lit up from three. A couple, a lot of that was late in the game. Um, Michigan's a uh, freshman played most of the last five minutes and sort of continued to struggle, which is definitely part of the reason is that they're playing all together at the same time. It'd be a little easier to look good if you're playing with other people who know what's going on. But it also speaks to the fact that this is really just a eight-man rotation, and Beeline seems pretty comfortable with that afterward. Um, He said that the biggest takeaway he has from tonight's game was that he's happy with his rotation and Hmm. didn't seem to be worried about growing it so i think he's ready to ride with what he's got um and but kevin easily did play well um should get a lot of uh socon buckets this year i would think oh yeah but chattanooga has a bit of work to do so for those who have no idea what we're talking about kevin easily was a one-time uh emerging star out of indianapolis who had a lot of high major attention including michigan and was waiting for right, waiting for an offer and waiting for an offer that ultimately never came and he kind of slipped from being a high major guy to a mid major guy. I think at one point he was re- VCU was he committed to VCU? I believe so. Yeah. He was at one he was like the number 1 8th grader in the country at yeah, one point. Yeah. But he sort of looked like he does now in 8th grade. Right. So that explains sort of his rise and fall. Right. Um so that's that's it on on Kevin Easley. Um Probably- and- more than we needed there. Well, sorry. Um, <laughs> you got to see North Carolina this uh, yeah week twice. What do you, what do you think about them, and how do they match up with Michigan? It'll be. Uh, I mean, obviously, as anyone knows who, who follows these things, you know, North Carolina's got they got some dudes. Um, you know, Luke May is still there. Uh, Kobe White, uh, as as you would say, Dylan, I think is a certified bucket getter. Uh, Nazir Little is a top 10 pick, maybe top five pick, um, threw down one of the nastiest dunks I've ever seen in Las Vegas last weekend. Uh, and Cameron Johnson is a guy who, um, not coincidentally, you'll, you will watch and play and say, man, he would really look good at Michigan. Uh, there's, there's a reason that Michigan recruited him when he transferred out of Pittsburgh. Um, he's a six, nine guy, multi-skilled kind of does a bit of everything, um, I like his game. I really like this Carolina team, except for the fact that um, there's no rock solid point guard. And I think this is the big difference between this Carolina team and all of the great Carolina teams that you've seen under Roy, right? If you can go back and pick off his teams and they're, they're basically an all American at point guard, uh, this team isn't that. So it's a little bit different, but they get after you. They can play. They're fearless. Luke May's a tank. Uh, Kobe White is, uh, he's a bad man and they got some guys. It's definitely going to be a great, great test, um, for Michigan. I think this is going to be a high level game. It might feel a little bit like March in there. Hopefully if we're, if we're all lucky, cause that's what I'm definitely looking forward to going into it. So where do you think, so last year, Michigan went to North Carolina on the back of Maui mm-hmm. and looked pretty gassed. Now it's kind of flipped. North Carolina yeah. has to fly from Vegas back to Chapel Hill and then up to Detroit on Wednesday. Do you think that plays an effect? And do you think the fact that they sort of got their – last year they were coming off of one of their worst losses. They just got embarrassed by Michigan State. Right. So a lot of sort of narrative stuff going on there. How do you think that plays in? That's interesting. Um, 
And yeah, I, I hadn't kind of, I, I obviously I'd thought about the fact that they played last year, but I hadn't thought about the the real role reversal that's going on here. Um, yeah, I mean, Michigan should be fully prepared for exactly w- this game, the circumstances, everything. Where North Carolina, I have to imagine their heads spinning a little bit. You know, two games against high major teams in Vegas, getting home, quick turnaround off a holiday. Um, it is a lot now, but the thing is with Carolina that a lot of other teams uh, don't have the benefit as benefit of is they have NBA talent all over the place. Right. I mean, they're just really, Helps. really, they're really, really good. Um, and you could, uh, you couldn't say that. I don't think again about Michigan last year. Right. And that's no disrespect to Duncan Robinson, who has gotten his cup of coffee in the league and Muhammad Ali, Abdul Rahman and everything, but they're, you know, there wasn't NBA guys all over the place. This this Carolina team has NBA guys all over the place. And uh, a lot of guys who have played a lot of games. Um, you know, Luke May. Luke May's been there. Um, and they are not going to be intimidated by coming into Chrysler. I can tell you that much. Whereas I think Michigan's team last year walked into uh, the Dean Dome maybe a little wide-eyed that early in the season. Um, but Carolina, I, I don't. I don't think so, but I'll t- I'll say this, and I know I always crap on Michigan fans, but like th- this is a time where you'd you, you'd expect. I know it's a nine thirty game, and God forbid people are going to act like they're being asked to watch the game outside or something. But um, this would be a good time, I think, for Michigan to prove that it can have uh, a certain level of home court advantage every once in a while. What do you think on that? Home court, I think they'll. That is always important. I don't know. That that's going to determine the game. It, it won't, helps Michigan, it won't, but I'm saying the look of it, man. Like when you're playing, when you're coming off of a na- uh, national championship game the year before, you're ranked top ten in the country. And you get and you get Carolina on the home floor. This should be about as good as it can get at at Chrysler, and I'm not I'm not sure if it's going to be. I wonder if if they're still everyone's going to still have their their sad pants on from Saturday. <laughs> That, that, that may be in the past. Uh, Big Ten ACC Challenge crowds haven't really ever been that good at Chrysler. I can't really think of one that has been. Um, it's usually those Saturday CBS games that get the yeah the Arizona game a couple the best years crowds. ago was really good. But who yeah who'd they play in the ACC Challenge that year? It was probably not a great crowd. Let's see. Um, either way, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, weekdays in November are not really when. Ann Arbor is necessarily geared up for basketball. Um, so we'll see about that. I think the two I think it's an interesting stylistic game for mm-hmm. two big reasons. Mm-hmm. Um Michigan's defense is really based on stopping transition offense, and North Carolina's offense is just all about playing fast and playing in transition. Yeah. Um it'll be interesting to see They will just try to where, outscore him a hundred percent. Where the pace ends up in this game. Um like UNC played games that were 80, 84, 82, 73 possessions this year. Michigan's playing games that are down in the mid 60s. Um, UNC doesn't play games like that unless they're playing Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're Michigan, I think you're looking at those Virginia games. Uh, I think they lost to Virginia last year um, on the road, 61, 49 in a 59 possession game. That's that's the Michigan game plan. You need to keep them out of transition at any means possible, and then try to hold your own on the defensive glass, which is probably going to be the biggest issue for them defensively, I would think. Yeah, Carolina will just try to get behind you a lot um, in the half court. That's what I, at least I, what I saw um, out in Vegas. That's where they got a lot of their, their scoring. Um, but they can also just go straight downhill. They're going to take they're going to take any three that you give them. Um, it, they they kind of... They kind of actually remind me of um, some Michigan teams of the past where there's just kind of a general non, you know, what was the word I used? A choreographed nonchalance to their defense. Uh, and then it was go down and just get a point and, and just hope that you can wear out the other team. So um, it'll be, for as much as we talk about this Michigan defense, I think this will be a super fascinating uh, matchup because this Carolina team, I'll tell you this, when things don't go well, they get really, really frustrated. Um I think some of the there is so much immaturity there, especially in in Little and White. Um, Kobe White meets Xavier Simpson. Yeah, exactly. So 
you know, guys like that, they do have experience with Luke May and Cam Johnson, but those aren't the guys who are going to get them into the offense, right? Those are the guys who everything is kind of geared toward, but there's stuff that they, they need other guys to do the work for them in a lot of ways. So if they go and stick White or Little in a box, you know, I assume Charles Matthews on Nazir Little, uh, I assume Xavier Simpson on Kobe White, you know, if those two go out and have big time performances defensively, they will frustrate Carolina for sure. And it will, it'll show on both ends. And then that's when Michigan scores, right? When, once the team gets frustrated on offense, they drag ass a little bit on the other end. And that's when a team that does have some offensive inefficiencies can suddenly get some buckets, you know, Luke may 27 points on 14 shots last year. Who guards him on Michigan? What's he listed at? I think he's like six, eight. Does that sound about right? He is listed at six, eight, two forty. Yeah. Um, I think I just put, I, I think I start with, um, I think I start with Teske on him and, and you put Iggy on who's starting at the center Garrison Brooks. Yeah, sure. I, I don't think I want Iggy on, uh, on Luke May. I like the idea of even for as strong as Iggy is, I do feel like not bullied, but I feel like Luke May can still be physical with him, right? I'm not sure if Luke May would be really that physical with with Teske. You know, he's an anchor back there. Once he sets his feet, it's hard to move him. Um, so I'd give Teske first shot and see how it goes. And the good thing for Michigan is you have three viable options to put on on May, depending on, on what he's doing and the touches that he's getting. I think it's a huge spot for Isaiah Livers. Mm -hmm. All this talk about Isaiah Livers... This is Michigan's defensive everything. Yeah. I think he his ability to guard someone like May, get it done on the glass, that's gonna be huge in this spot. Um he's wasn't nearly ready for it last year. I think he played a decent amount last year there and they just got blown off the court, but he was he, I don't think he knew anything what was going on at that point last year. And this year now he's one of the smartest players on the court for Michigan. So We'll see. Um, I think that'll he'll play a huge role in this game, even if he comes off the bench. Um, they just need him to match up with some of that front line size. Yeah, I don't think anyone knew, really knew what the hell was going on in that Carolina game. That's why you know a lot of it's not um, translatable to this conversation here. You know that in that game, yeah, Livers played 18 minutes, but it'd be Watson played 12. Um, you know, I think the they, they were very much Eli Brooks was still starting. Um, Jaron Simpson came off the bench and gave him nine. I think mostly that was in the second half, but um, yeah, that I was... mean they started that last game with Duncan Robinson on Luke May and he just <laughs> tore him apart. It um, didn't go well. So they'll have uh, they'll probably some takeaways there on how to uh, approach that better. Um, but it should be a, a heck of a game for November and chance for Michigan to get a big win at home for sure, for sure. Um, and it's a big game for the Big Ten. And uh, so far, so good in a lot of ways um, on, on the league, picking up some marquee wins. I think you could make the case, tell me if I'm wrong, would this be the best win for the league? This year? Um, probably. Yeah. Uh, it depends how you see Villanova or some like a home game. You can't right. really, it's hard to compare compared to games on a neutral or a um, road venue. Right, like fair. Even if Carolina, you say, is a top five team and Villanova is a top twenty five team, beating one on the road is about equal to the other at home. Fair. Well, so should we do our uh, Big Ten power ranking and think dive into that? I think it's that time. So earlier today, uh, Dylan and I just kind of went back and forth, and we put together a, a power ranking where he picked the team, and then I picked the team, and then he picked the team, and then I picked the team, and on we go. I'm sure there's some disagreement here. Uh, I know of one hot, hot disagreement, but I, I look forward to getting into. Uh, but let's start it off. Dylan had the first selection, and uh, I don't think his pick was much of a surprise. I had the first pick. I went with Michigan. They have a great road win. They won their neutral court tournament, and they haven't lost, and they have the best defense in the country. We've talked about them for the last 20 minutes, so yeah. probably don't need to harp on no. Michigan too much. Yeah, uh, Michigan State at number two, and this is how the AP and any ranking would go right now. Uh, Michigan is slightly ahead of Michigan State. Hold, uh, hold on, what? any ranking. 
not the net ranking. The net ranking let's, as well. Let the record show that the net has Ohio State at number one. Well, fair, but I was saying between the two in terms of who's ranked higher, Michigan, Michigan State, even in the net. Uh, okay, Michigan's that's at fair. four. Michigan State's at seven. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's pretty obvious. And anyone doing a power ranking right now would have Michigan and Michigan State one and two. So we go to Dylan for number three in the power rankings. I took Wisconsin. Um, they've been impressive to me. They played well at down in Atlantis. Um, Ethan Happ is obviously still Ethan Happ, but I think Demetric Trice has really been a guy who has stood out early for them. He missed most of last year with a foot injury and was pretty terrible before he was out, but he's shooting the ball like he was as a freshman. Um, he's really given them sort of another dynamic option at guard that they haven't had, and their defense has been awesome. They did lose to Virginia, but losing to Virginia in the third game in three days on a neutral court isn't really all that much to complain about, and I think they look more like a Wisconsin team that you've come to expect in the Big Ten. And for what it's worth, I watched some of that um, that Virginia game, and I thought in the first half they looked really good. Um, it, it got away from them a little bit, but I don't think – like it looked like they belonged on the court with Virginia, um, which is which says a lot. Um, and obviously, obviously a big step forward for a team that missed the tournament last year. So uh, at number four, I took Iowa, uh, which is 5-0 and now after uh, an impressive performance. Uh, some some impressive performances this year. They already have wins over Oregon and UConn. Um, and fittingly enough, it's Wisconsin Iowa is one of the first uh, Big Ten games of the year, which I think will be a really really entertaining game to watch. But um, Iowa was one of those teams that, on paper, you would say, man, you know, if they can just play some defense, they've got some guys. You know, they've got guys who look like traditional Iowa players when Iowa is good. Uh, Bahannon, Tyler Cook being the two most notable. But uh, I think, you know, Connor McCaffrey is probably giving them a little bit more than people anticipated. He's pretty good. And at word out of uh, at Iowa is that he's kind of changing some things. I think his presence on the court um, is changing some things. So maybe something that people didn't quite anticipate, but, um, you know, he put up 19 on UConn, um, and has given them something that they really needed. And that's, that's another score. And maybe someone who, um, can communicate a little bit with guys on the court and can translate what the head coach is saying without screaming in people's faces. So that's good. Uh, (laughs) I, I have two, two Iowa stats for you last year after Christmas, they held one team under a point per possession. That's one game in their final 19 wow. games. They held someone below a point per possession. This year, every game under a point per possession. Obviously, they haven't all been against good teams, but they were just. It was. It's hard to explain how terrible they were on defense last year, and they just had to be somewhat better. And the results are backing that up. Well, they so far. Ha- well they held Oregon to uh, 69 points. Pretty good. Because mm-hmm. that same team went and scored 80 on Syracuse the next night. Yep, and a lot of people have been saying it's all about their zone defense. They're playing zone on like half their possessions, but their man has actually been better early on for what it's worth according to the synergy stats. So that's something to keep an eye on too. Mm, Very interesting. All right, what do you got number five? I've got Ohio State, um, the number one team in the net (laughs) rankings, only five in this very official podcast rankings. I would have picked them before Iowa personally, but Mm -hmm. they've won two top 40 Ken Palm road games they only won one all of last year um it was really easy to kind of discount what they did last year and say well Bates Diep was back and he was hurt and who gets a player like that in his first year but I think the biggest takeaway right now is that Chris Holton is just a hell of a coach Mm -hmm. they go and just grind out wins Uh, they won at Creighton without a single starter in double figures wow Uh, which is hard to do and it just kind of speaks to the fact that it's not really one guy on that team that is a star but They're just going to out-tough you down the end, and that's really what they did to Cincinnati and Creighton. I don't know what the ceiling is for playing like that, but no one's going to want to play against them, if you ask me. Yeah, and uh, Grand Rapids native Dwayne Washington had a great great showing in that Creighton game. He scored 12 off the bench, I believe. Um, But I I do – I like what – what Dwayne gives them, and I've always, I've I've been I've been high on him for a long time, mainly because he's he's a great 
kid to deal with and um, wrote about him back in the day. But um, Dwayne Washington getting a chance to show Michigan, Michigan State that maybe they should have prioritized him a little bit more is going to be a very interesting uh, storyline to watch. So uh, I enjoy watching Ohio State this year in part because I enjoy watching him. But um, they do have a lot of ways that they can beat you. You know, the fact that you win – you win a game of Creighton with C.J. Jackson scoring six points when at any given night he can also put 25 on you. That's a tough thing to game plan for. So uh, I do like yep. Ohio State for sure. Where are we at now? Number We're six. at six. Man, I fought with this one. And oh. I... <laughs> Dylan, who we do video when we watch this or when we uh, record this so that we can see each other. <laughs> and so I picked Minnesota six, which, I mean, I was hemming and hawing and – I'm not buying in on it, and I, I watched from the bar at what city were we? Where were we? Connecticut. Connecticut. Dylan, yeah, uh, you went. You, it was past your bedtime, and you had an early flight, and so I went down to the hotel bar and I watched uh, some of the game against Texas A&M, and they looked they looked ugly, but they still won, and they're five and zero, and they got a win over Washington this past weekend. Um, but the thing that gets me about Minnesota continually is the number of guys on that team that I like and wish that I could watch them on other teams. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like they've just got great pieces in a lot of ways. Um, you know, give me Amir coffee and Jordan Murphy on almost any team. Um, they, they, so, got, they got guys. Okay. What's that? What, you... what stat do you have to, to shit? I don't have here? a stat. We just need to talk about you always picking Minnesota and overrating them all. They're like a, they're like a penny stock where you triple or quadruple your money, but then you put all your money into it and it goes to zero, and then you do the same thing over again. I know, I know. That's it's just the same thing with Minnesota. I don't um, disagree, but I mean, right now, okay, so I put them sixth in the league right now. I know you're going to argue about Indiana, and I know you'll probably put Nebraska ahead to them, maybe Purdue. I don't know. Where would you have Minnesota in yours? I would have Minnesota. Probably after Indiana, Purdue, and Nebraska. Okay. So that would be around nine. Are we at? Would that be? But let's 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 give Indiana their a little time here. You gotta. I'm the only one over here on Archie Island, which isn't the most profitable uh, strategy right now. But well, uh, I considering I'm considering, taking the, considering I'm taking the boat off of Richard Patino uh, Island. Uh, you're preaching to the uh, choir. Go ahead, Indiana. <laughs> Indiana. Blitzed Marquette at home, yeah. and no one wants to go to Assembly Hall, so that's not a huge surprise. Right. Then they took a tough loss at Bud Walton Arena down in Arkansas mm -hmm. and fouled after missing a wide-open tip-in that would have won in the game. Mm -hmm. A brutal turn of events. But really the story here is injuries. Um, Devontae Green, McRoberts, Deron Davis, and Jerome Hunter have all been dealing with varying levels of injuries, and I think there was a point there down to like six or seven scholarship guys. Um, they need to get healthy. I think the Jerome Hunter injury is the long Killer. term injury of that that bunch. But they haven't looked necessarily great, but I still think there's talent there. Romeo Langford looks to be the real deal and he's only gonna get better. Um but I think you gotta still you can't really knock him for losing the game against a decent Arkansas team on the road. Yeah, uh, I would I, I would tend I would tend to agree. Um the the problem with with Indiana that I just kind of run into is when I've seen them, I just haven't been like, man, you know what I mean? Like I, at no point, and now granted, I haven't sat down and watched all their games. I haven't watched all this stuff, but like anytime that I've seen them, I just haven't, I've kind of shrugged, you know? So, um, it's tough. Um, and we were in the, it's just, I, I just want, I want to believe in Indiana. I just need them to give me a reason to, <laughs> Yeah, you missed. We both missed their best performance of the year, though. The Marquette game was right, right. after the Michigan Villanova game. But guess what? Which, they get they get a chance at least this weekend to show that I'm not. I'm they're not going to beat Duke, okay? Um, but can they not lose? Maybe not get run off the court would be good. You know, put up a game. I would love to see that game at Assembly Hall. Me too, one hundred percent. I don't know if it's worth watching at uh, Cameron. We'll with, see. with Duke coming off a loss, yeah, I don't. Think yeah, so. <laughs> might be ugly. <laughs> um, who, do you, okay. who do you have next? Where are we here? Uh, at number eight, I have uh, Purdue. Um, Carson Edwards is playing up to most expectations. They have a neutral court loss to uh, Virginia Tech, which is not um, 
a bad thing in any way. My, one of the problems, you know, the reason really for Purdue's ranking right now is it doesn't have a quality win. So you got to beat someone for uh, the teams ahead of them have wins. Um, Purdue, that win over Davidson is nice. Davidson might win the A-10 this year, but that means very little because the A-10 sucks. But um, they did pound them, though. They beat beat Davidson by 21, which is pretty impressive. But um, this is a big week for Purdue. Um, they get Florida State and they get Michigan, both on the road. Um, it These are tests. And if they go 0-2, I don't think it means that they are not a potential competitor in the conference by any means but in terms of if you want to make a statement or whatever cliche you want to use you know go steal a win here or there but this is a brutal stretch for Purdue altogether they go to Florida State to Michigan Maryland at home away at Texas and then uh Notre Dame I think that game's in Indianapolis yeah for the Crossroads Classic that stretch reminds me a lot of sort of where Michigan was at at this time last year Mm -hmm. um they have some really tough road games then they're going to, even if they lose the first two, it's going to be about saving face. What Michigan last year, they beat Indiana and UCLA at home and then went yeah. to Texas. Um, yeah. Sort of, you got to do something here. Uh, there's chances there, but the problem is that you, this get, is you a start schedule, getting your back up against the wall. This is a schedule for last year's Purdue team. I don't know about this year's Purdue team. That's still trying to figure out a lot of stuff. Uh, so we'll see, but it'll be interesting. You know, if they take a pounding on this stretch, say you know they so these are this is a five game say they go two and three or one and four you know how does this group respond to kind of being in that position after after last season they'll be really curious to to pay attention to at the same time if you go three and two in that stretch you're feeling pretty good about yourself Pretty good absolutely two and three you're fine one and four oh and five you're in a world of hurt. Mm-hmm. It's when it's if you're going into that Notre Dame game on a four game losing streak when it feels like your whole season's sort of Definitely. riding on the edge there. Definitely, and it's December. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, number nine, Dylan. I've got Nebraska mostly just because I have to pick them. Um, I'm so sick of all the Nebraska people crying all summer about how they didn't make the tournament, how they just didn't get enough chances to win games away from home. And then they just go and they have their chance against a Texas Tech team that has four new starters and they just get blown off the court. Is You have to win those games eventually. And mm-hmm. they're going to Clemson tonight. Clemson is a Clemson good is team. Good. I, don't, good. I don't know if they can beat a good team away from home. And they have a great home court advantage, but until they show it, I don't, you can't, I don't care if you hold Southeast or in Louisiana and Mississippi Valley State to 35 points. It's, you have to go beat a good team. Yep outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, and they haven't done it. Yeah, and it was interesting that win over Seton Hall was pretty solid, but then Seton Hall went and lost to St. Louis, um, which made you say, oh, maybe they're not that great. But then Seton Hall went and beat Miami. They beat Miami. Beat Miami, which is a good win. Um, so, you know, you're you're right. Nebraska. Um, you're an eight ten guy. Don't sleep on SLU. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a long nap on SLU. Thanks, though. Um, but then in Nebraska's – their first two games uh, – in Big Ten play are Illinois and Minnesota. This is one of the, and it's at Minnesota. Those are two games where it's, all right, if you are what you say you are, like, you better be. You better win this game against Clemson, start off 2-0 and in the league, and then go play Creighton. Um, because these are, this is exactly what you're talking about. You know, you, you, you whine, moan, complain for, for so long. Well, it's time to win some games, boys, so... We'll see. I think Nebraska's right where they belong in this ranking. Um, and now we go on to number 10, and Maryland uh, is my pick there, which is, uh, I believe, still undefeated. Yeah, they're 6-0. and um, Their best win is over Marshall. So um, the schedule uh, is bullshit. Is, it has them exactly where they belong. Um, it's pretty embarrassing for, for a program like Maryland to – uh, have a schedule like this because even if you go deeper, it's not like there's great marquee games waiting in the distance. Uh, they have Virginia tonight or on Wednesday, which was scheduled for them, right? And then uh, their next biggest game, they have a home game against Seton Hall, and the rest of their non conference schedule is Loyola Chicago, Loyola Maryland. Not many teams play two Loyolas in a year, and I, I, I Top- love. Love the Jesuits, but come on, man. Uh, and then also Radford. So 
that fills out a non-conference that currently includes Delaware, Navy, North Carolina A&T, Hofstra, Mount St. Mary, and Marshall. And so, how many non-conference games do they play outside the state of Maryland? Uh, zero. Zero. Loyola Chicago, That's a, where's that game? It's in Baltimore. Baltimore, okay. And they so, played Navy at Navy. So, you know, uh, this Maryland team is the team that, that deserves – to go if the Big Ten is really really good, right, and it's and it becomes an eight bid league or something like that. Maryland's the team that deserves to go ten and ten and not get a bid because that schedule is absolute horseshit. So, uh, congrats on that, Terps. Uh, number eleven, Dylan. I've got Northwestern. Um, Vic Law has been incredible for them early on. He's shooting the ball really well from three, forty five percent. He's leading the team in assist rate. He's their best defender, rebounding, doing everything. He's been awesome. They also lost by 20 points to Fresno State on a neutral floor. Right. Uh, not great. No. Um, they bounced back with a good win last night when everyone else was watching NFL. They uh, knocked off Utah good on win. a neutral, which sort of salvaged their week over there. And uh, I think they're in California, I want to say. Um, yeah, either way. Team. Fullerton. So either way, I they're a pretty good team to be near the bottom of the Big Ten. Sure. I think they've proven that they have some talent, and they even without a real point guard, they just I don't. It's a pretty. It's not an easy pushover team, and I think a lot of people thought they might be when they lost everyone. But I know it might have been a hot take when I said Brian McIntosh was addition by subtraction, <laughs> but he wasn't an efficient player and. Vic Law has been as that primary guy, so it's an upgrade, I think. Well, I've not I've not seen Northwestern yet, so I don't really have any takes on them. But I do like them to steal a win for the league in the Big Ten ACC, uh, taking down Josh Passner and uh, those Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Uh, that should be, I, I think, that's a good win for the league, right? You want your bottom to beat their bottom. Are and, we calling that stealing a game? They're seven point favorites. Well, you know what I mean. Steal a game for the league. You want the bottom of yours to beat the bottom of the other one. This is this is how conference RPIs or nets, whatever the hell you want to call it, are built. You 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 need to win these games. So that's fair. Northwestern should do the league a good service there and get a win there. Uh, We've number, got an upset at twelve. Number twelve. This is this is the the real sticking point with with Mr. Burkhart over there. I have Rutgers at number twelve. Um, they got they got hammered by St. John's in their one loss of at the home. year at home, uh, but they got a couple wins. They, uh, look, they don't have any good wins. They're four, <laughs> they're four and one. Um, they're they're not very good. But over my dead body was I going to rank Penn State, which lost to DePaul ahead of Rutgers, which doesn't have a bad loss, um, and I was not going to rank uh, Illinois ahead of Rutgers because Illinois is not very good. And Rutgers currently hasn't done anything for, to get the trash designation, right? If they went and lost to EMU or they lost to Drexel or something, you know, if they did typical Rutgers stuff, yes, they fall right back into their slot at 14 like usual. But if you put another Jersey on this, on their early season record, you wouldn't default them to last in the league. 20-point home losses are not a great look. I, I'm just saying, St. John's pretty good, though. They're all right. Well, they're pretty good. I, <laughs> all right. I've got Penn State next. Um, Penn State's sort of a similar deal to Northwestern, where Lamar Stevens has been playing out of his out mind. Out of his mind, yes. Doing everything that he possibly could and doing it pretty well. Um, they... Have some pieces. Miles Dredd, the freshman guard, has shot it really well. Josh Reeves is a great 3 and D guy. But they also lost to DePaul, as Brendan mentioned, mm-hmm. and lost to Bradley by three points. Um, apparently, teams from Illinois are just a tough ask for uh, the boys from Pennsylvania. Yeah, Bradley, which lost to Illinois-Chicago, which was started off the year 0-3 with losses to Radford and Duquesne, by the way. So, um, yeah, those are... Oh, look, the, the the Penn State ranking is as much because of just the general disappointment of those two losses. Um, I, I I thought Penn State was going to be a little bit better than that, and to just start off with two kind of kicks in the ass like that. Is, no, Mike Watkins hurts though. Absolutely, no doubt. You're right. 
Um, but now they got games against Virginia Tech, Maryland, Indiana, and it could be very quickly Penn State's three and four and out of the conversation for the rest of the year. So just business as usual in State College. True. Well, last year they were still in the mix. Sort of. <laughs> they started off 5-0 and last year with a win against a very crappy Pittsburgh team. But um, All right, and dragging up the rear, our friends from uh, – is this my pick or yours? This is yours. This is mine. Um, Illinois. Uh, I'm not really sure where where this program is is heading. Um, they don't have a horrible loss, right? Their their four losses are Georgetown, Gonzaga, Iowa State, and Xavier. But their only wins are Mississippi Valley State and Evansville, and. When I watch them play, it still looks like the, – the the moments that I've seen them, it still looks like a bunch of guys who've never actually played together. Um, and a lot of ways they, they are, but um, they look discombobulated at best. I have a couple uh, Illinois thoughts. Okay, here we go. Whoever whoever signed them up to go to Maui, whenever that was done, <laughs> that's just brutal. Um, they're not ready to play Gonzaga, Iowa State, and Xavier on neutral floors. That's, that's just terrible for a team 100%. that is – 306 and then experience on Ken Palm. Mm-hmm. Second, Brad Underwood's best team was renowned for throwing out its defense in the middle of the year. So what has he done since he got to Illinois is play that defense that he threw away. <laughs> They're 10th in the country in forced turnover rate. They're trapping, I guess you can say it works. They're 319th in effective field goal percentage, 247th in offensive rebounding, 312th in free throw rate allowed. Not great. Teams make 59% of their two. If you're just giving up a layup every time, it doesn't matter if you force a turnover once every four possessions. Like, at some point, you have to realize that's not really going to be the the answer. Not a winning strategy. And it seemed like he did, and now he's just going back to it. But they do have talented pieces. They can actually shoot this year. Um, They have really fun guards to watch. Uh, Trent Frazier's been playing really well. Um, They're shooting... 41% 41% from three this year after shooting 33% last year. Like, they're, they're pieces, but they just I just don't understand what they're trying to do. I don't think they're very good. And uh, they have their next few games are at Notre Dame, at Nebraska, Ohio State at the United Center in Chicago, uh, and then they have a home game against UNLV. There is a sh- certainly a chance um, that they go one and three, almost certainly. Uh, and there's a chance for 0-4. I don't think anyone would be stunned if UNLV went and got a win there. Um, hmm? you know, there's... Don't, don't sleep on an early Big Ten upset from the Illini. Okay. Well, I'm going to predict that there are only two wins until for the rest of non-conference play are East Tennessee State and Florida Atlantic, and that they go into league play uh, with two wins and nothing going for them. It's a safe bet. Sell. Hard sell on a on the boys from Champagne, So that'll do it for the first, uh, what do we call this? The moving screen power ranking. Yeah. The power ranking draft, whatever okay. we want to call All it. Right. I don't know. Um, hope it was enjoyable for you. Uh, I got a boogie cause I have to go get a car and drive to, uh, Louisville, uh, which is the proper pronunciation. And so I will have a good meal tonight and some bourbon and get ready for a, a big one tomorrow down there well i guess it's kind of a big one but it's a big one down there i don't know if it's a big one everywhere else but uh, i'm definitely curious to see this one so uh, we'll have a lot to talk about i think next week will be a good example of a good split pod uh, between michigan and michigan state which two legit top 10 programs so i think it was a uh, maybe a good idea to start this podcast this year what about you dylan it's good timing and now we got some uh, good hoops coming up love it love it so thanks as always for listening subscribe uh, leave a rating if you enjoy it. Uh, if you don't, uh, still leave a good rating anyway <laughs> and uh, tell your friends. And that's it. You got anything to parting message, Dylan? It's good. All right. Huh. See you guys next week.